This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. If you're ready to break free from diet culture and reclaim the life it stole from you, learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, body liberation, and taking down diet culture. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm an anti-diet registered dietitian, certified intuitive eating counselor, and author of the book, Anti-Diet, Reclaim Your Time, Money, Well-Being, and Happiness Through Intuitive Eating, which is available now wherever books are sold. Join me here every week as I interview interesting people from all different backgrounds about their paths toward peace with food and their bodies. And by the way, on this show, we bleep out diet culture stuff like weight and calorie numbers, but we don't censor swear words or other adult language, so listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to episode 269 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with media studies scholar and author Emily Contois for her second appearance on the pod, and her first episode about the history of diet culture is a fan favorite and one that I reference often, so definitely recommend checking that out after this one if you haven't already heard it. But this time around, we discuss gender dynamics in food media and marketing, Her new book, Diners, Dudes, and Diets, How Gender and Power Collide in Food, Media, and Culture, The Avatar of the Dude, The Parallels Between Quote-Unquote Dad Bod and Body Positivity, and so much more. I can't wait to share our conversation with you in just a moment. First, though, I just want to give a heads up that I have a big announcement coming up next week, so make sure to tune in to next week's episode for that. And the news I'm going to share partly involves my newsletter. So if you want to get a little ahead of the game, you can subscribe to that at christyharrison.com slash email. That's christyharrison.com slash email. And now it's time for Ask Food Psych. In recent months and years, I've gotten a number of different versions of this question that asks essentially, how have colonialism and white supremacy taken away foods that are central to black, indigenous, and communities of color and replaced them with white foods? And how does this play into diet culture? So I posed that question to Joy Cox, who's been on the podcast a couple times before, friend of the pod, and she wrote about this issue in her book, Fat Girls in Black Bodies, and she joined me as a co-host to answer that question. So before we play her answer, I just want to give my standard disclaimer that these answers and this podcast in general are for informational and educational purposes only, aren't a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice, and don't constitute a provider-patient relationship with me or my co-hosts. And by the way, thanks to everyone who asked that question. Here now is Joy with her answer. This is definitely a question that I have asked myself and also have touched on in my own book. And I think is right on track as raising these questions and concerns as it relates to diet culture, intuitive eating, and cultural traditions. Although my background as a Black woman I have kind of African indigenous roots, looking at the ways by which Black communities are often scrutinized for the foods that they eat and the ways by which African culture has been colonized. And we find that white supremacy is pervasive in in so many different contexts. I think that having white supremacy show up in in the foods and in diet culture I think that is is well evident. Uh, something that I touch about in my book, particularly, is about the ways by which foods are prepared in a lot of indigenous communities. Um, and if you look at by African traditions, there is a lot of food that has been prepared as soups and sauces, right, which don't really adhere to what we would see um, in more European or on more European plates, right, as it relates to like your vegetables being in one space and your meat being in another in another space. What we find in a lot of um, communities is that they mix their vegetables, they mix their meats, they mix their fats, they mix 
their grains all together and they make more dishes that kind of look like casseroles or they kind of reflect that a bit more. In West African traditions, we have things like jollof rice, which is really a form of like rice pilaf whenever you think about French cuisine uh, and things like that. And so you see that you can see how, you know, rice pilaf, right, is is celebrated as a food to be eaten, whereas, you know, you don't hear as much about indigenous foods as it relates to these other communities, right? And so how is it that rice pilaf can be acceptable where um, jollof rice is not? Or when we talk about soups and we talk about sauces and we talk about, you know, the type of nutrients that individuals are supposed to be getting whenever they're eating these, more European standards would say, you know, you need at least servings of vegetables a day, but how do you measure that in a sauce? How do you measure that in a soup, right? And so definitely when we talk about colonialism having this impact on the type of foods that other cultures, one, have access to, two, that are celebrated in communities, right? And, And three, that are not demonized, you find that white supremacy is pervasive and it runs deep in in those spaces and there's not room for those things. And what I kind of talk about in my book is that it's a lot more about assimilation, right? So your foods aren't acceptable and you should eat what they recommend. You should be taking in what what other people are saying, right? So uh, who cares if it's your, you know, who cares if it's your culture or your community's bread, right? That's not going to count as something that's meaningful because of white supremacy and you should be eating the bread that other people recommend. Um, and so I think that colonialism plays a huge role primarily and historically in the ways that indigenous communities have practiced eating and have practiced eating within their culture. And then when we talk about these matters of intuitive eating, right, the the type of stigma that is associated with indigenous practices around eating food and, and how culture plays a role in that, right, you automatically think that the foods that you that you have, you know, historically grown up in, um, or grown up consuming, um, are wrong, and they're bad, right? So you shouldn't want to eat things like macaroni and cheese, and you shouldn't want to eat things like the ways that your family cooks chicken or the way that you know rice is prepared in your culture, because historically that's always been demonized and it's always been stigmatized and you've always been told that those things are bad. So almost like connecting back to your culture and also wanting to practice intuitive eating, um, there there's this constant tension that's happening between the two and you're trying to reconcile what that's like in that space, right? Um, because for a lot of indigenous cultures, like food is so intertwined in the things that we do. Um, and, you know, and I, again, I talk about this in my book about how like the kitchen is almost seen as a sacred place in black communities and the importance of that, right? And the importance of our cultural t- traditions and how food shows up in those spaces that now when we talk about diet culture and we talk about how it's spread around in our own communities, how that's also a space that becomes problematic. And so we are regurgitating what we're hearing people say about our culture and about our foods and about our cultural traditions and feeling the pressure of having to change those traditions and change what we eat as a way to, again, not necessarily become quote unquote healthy, but to assimilate to a dominant mindset as to the foods that we should be eating. Because when you really look at the foundation of what a lot of indigenous cultures, a lot of the foods that they eat, all the food groups are there. <laughs> all of the nutrients that you need to help you know, fuel your body and sustain you are there. So it's not an issue of the content, right? And if it's not an issue of the content, then it's an issue of something else. And that's something else, in my opinion, is white supremacy. And those are the things that need to be rooted out. Uh, and so... I hope that I kind of gave a little bit of um, understanding as it relates to those things without rambling too much. No, that was great. Thank you. I think it's so important, so much of what you said. I mean, especially this idea that like the my plate version of how we're quote unquote supposed to eat, where it's like everything is separated and you see, you know, this much vegetables, which I mean, don't even get me started on that. That's like a whole other thing. But with this idea that nutrition and a nutritious plate is quote unquote supposed to look a certain way. If you're someone who is from 
an indigenous culture or who, you know, someone who's black who has the these long standing traditions or another person of color or person of an ethnicity that has like really deep culinary roots and traditions that have been demonized by white supremacy. How do you start to go about untangling that? I think a lot of people listening to this podcast come to it because they're like obsessed with food and health and they're trying to heal their relationships with food. And so I think it's a, you know, it's a tricky thing to start untangling, right? This idea of what quote unquote health is supposed to look like in this white supremacist culture. How do you start to push back against those notions and to embrace your culinary traditions without feeling like you're doing something quote unquote wrong? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, thinking about a a journey where to start, I think for me, like I'm just a big person about facts. And in some ways, I'm kind of biased in this sense because I have a background in culinary arts. So me wanting to tap back into culinary traditions that relate back to my culture, it's easy for me to get a recipe (laughs) and start to look at what's actually going into the food that I'm making. Now, everybody doesn't cook it, but at the same time, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't hurt to look at the recipe. Right. And so, you know, as I'm preparing myself to make curry goat, I'm looking at what's going into that recipe. And I'm seeing that there is tomato paste <laughs> that goes into the recipe. I'm seeing that there's curry, which has a base in turmeric, right, which can be an anti-inflammatory property. I'm seeing those things that go in. I'm seeing the onions that you put in and the garlic and the scallions and all of these things. And as I'm looking at this, right, there's nothing in in, in my level of expertise or nothing that I'm looking at in the recipe that screams, you know, red flagish type things. So again, if it's not the content, right, what is it? And I think, you know, for me, it's it's being able to get back to those spaces and those those spaces of facts. You know, if I'm cooking chicken, right, um, to this day, everybody swears by like chicken breasts, but scientifically, there is no difference, like, quote unquote, health benefits that show that chicken breasts are, are better than chicken thighs or drumsticks and, and all of these things, right? And so if you are um, a Black person or if you're um, within the community of color, if you just don't have the money and you want to buy drumsticks, and looking at the facts, you shouldn't feel bad. You shouldn't feel bad about that, right? But these are ways by which, again, when we think about white supremacy, when we think about the power that lies within and, um, the economy and who gets to say what and what's healthy for you and what's not healthy for you, you know, we kind of unpack these things and we kind of see where where power lies because chicken breasts are two times as more, if not more than that, than a chicken drumstick or a chicken thigh. So for me, it's always good to kind of come back to facts. If you are really concerned about what you are eating, yeah, I mean, I would recommend looking at recipes. I would recommend looking at what actually is going into the dishes that your culture, your community readily eats. And then I think, you know, the other part is understanding that there's so much more to food than just calories and ingredients, right? And we're finding other ways to connect back to our culture outside of those, um, the rules that have been set up. So if the structure of fat phobia and diet culture is like, you know, if the foundation of that is white supremacy, then we want to do away with that anyway. And we want to actively seek and find ways that we can continue to divest from those practices. And that may not be something that happens in one day, but it's something that we can start to put into motion, right? And so we're looking for the opposite of those things. Instead of me standing over a pot counting calories um, and thinking about, you know, what the National Heart Association is saying about my food that has the same type of nutrients and ingredients in it as a, a more European dish, right? I am also celebrating and I am congregating with people that I care about. And we are having real conversations around food, right? Because I was just thinking about this the other day and how, you know, food is a source of healing for, for a lot of us. It's a place where we congregate around, whether that's happy times, whether that's sad times. And the magic that goes into that when I'm in a kitchen and I'm cooking a meal for people that I care about, that far outweighs, okay, is this servings of a vegetable or is this 
And so really switching, you know, switching our focus as to what's important to us and what matters. But also, you know, if you are more of the person that needs, you know, this logical type of evidence, read the recipes, read what it is that, you know, you're putting in your foods and then compare them to leading recipes or or meals that that are often pushed. Uh, in society. And you'll find that a lot of the foods that we eat are very much the same as as to what they have in them. And so that should also, I think, encourage people to dig a little bit deeper to find out, you know, what the real issue is. Yeah, it's so interesting when I teach like gentle nutrition, which is the last, the 10th and last principle of intuitive eating for a reason, because it's hard to approach nutrition in a gentle way until you've really broken down the diet mentality and rejected diet culture and all of its sneaky forms. And that takes a while. But once you can eventually like start thinking about nutrition again, the way that I really teach it is like looking at culinary traditions from around the world and what they have in common. And there's so much in common. There's always a carb of some kind. There's starches involved. There's some kind of protein. There's some kind of fat. There's sauce. There's vegetables or fruits. It's all there. It's just in different configurations and different forms. And like you said, in some cultures, it's the vegetables are in a sauce. In some cultures, they're mixed together with the rice. And, you know, certain culinary traditions, it's all in one pot. In certain culinary traditions, it's separated or it's like a sandwich and a salad or whatever it might be, right? There's different configurations. But I think the way that people have been conditioned to think about quote unquote healthy food in our culture is so based in white supremacy, as you said, that there's sort of this dismissal of other foods as quote unquote bad. And oftentimes too, I think there's this relic of thinking about fat as bad, right? Like, and like you said, with the chicken, it's like, we really don't actually have to worry about total fat and even really saturated fat is debated. It's not it's not the scourge that it was made out to be years ago. And having, you know, a, a fattier cut of meat is not back in the 80s and 90s. It's like, oh my God, like don't ever eat beef or don't ever eat chicken with the fat, the skin on it or whatever. And now it's like, okay, that's not the focus. That's not what we need to be worrying about. But I think that's still sort of a relic of a lot of people's thinking and even like some doctors are like avoid fat, you know. And then now there's like the low carb thing of like fearing carbs and thinking you need, you need to avoid carbs. And so I think that's also part of where some of this demonization of food comes from is that in cultures around the world we know that like fat makes food taste good <laughs> and carbs make food taste good and be filling, right? And be satisfying. Like you have to have starches to like make the meal satisfy you. And so that's common among so many different culinary traditions. And yet there's this diet culture focus of like wanting to take those things away, which then leads to more demonization of other cultures' foods. Right. And I mean, it's such an individualistic culture, society that we live in right now that everybody's striving to be the best. And the reason why I bring that up is because when we talk about health and when we talk about foods, right? There's always like, it's the one, right? Or it's the only way. And it really does have an impact on people of only looking at things and considering things one way. It takes away the critical thinking that there could be something else. And I think diet culture has been extremely successful in being able to do that and saying, there's only one way your body can be. There's only one good way to really eat. Even if you think about the diets that are typically pushed, one diet tends to get more shine and spotlight than all the other diets at one time, right? And so it's like the Atkins diet trend and the Mediterranean diets trend. It's never like this, oh, you can try this or you can do this or maybe do this or try this instead, right? And so at the end of the day, we've all kind of been bitten in some shape, way, or form by the impact of diet culture, And I kind of talk about this in my book, right, how oftentimes diet culture shows up repurposed in cultures based on their own cultural norms. And so it's just so important that we kind of take a step back and understand that diet culture isn't just like the list of like eat this and not that. It's a mindset around how we see our bodies moving, how we see our bodies showing up in the world, and then also the food that we partake of. And so there is no best 
way per se, right? There is no one way to do a thing. And I think that as you, you know, kind of like what you said, right? It's a journey. As you start to unpack those things, then you also open yourself up to these other alternatives, to these other ways of thinking about food, practicing body movement, and and really just changing and in some ways going back to indigenous practices and the ways that food has been prepared in the past. But you give yourself the liberty to do that because you're no longer holding yourself um, under that structure of diet culture or under that structure of white supremacy and individualism that says there has to only be one way or there has to be a best way. Only one thing can get shine. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. This is so great. I could talk to you forever. Can you tell us where people can find you and learn more about your work online and learn more about your book as well? Yeah, sure. So people can find me, IG, Facebook. I'm fresh out the cocoon, all one word. And you can find more information about the book, also about the work that I'm involved in at drjoycox.com. And that's D-R-J-O-Y-C-O-X.com. Amazing. We'll put links to that in the show notes too. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Thank you for having me. So thanks again to Joy for that answer and to all the folks who sent in a version of that question. If you want to submit your own question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming episode, go to christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. And then, of course, if you want to have me answer your questions a lot more quickly than I can here and get to ask me whatever you want for as long as you want, come join my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals, where I do a monthly Q&A podcast that's just for course participants and give you some individual support and guidance for all your questions about intuitive eating. The course also has 13 modules of audio and written content that you can do at your own pace. And there's a private community forum just for course participants where you can get support from other people who are on this anti-diet path and connect with people around the world working on intuitive eating, as well as get some real-time guidance from me and my team about all your questions. If you're ready to break free from diet culture and reclaim the life it stole from you, learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. And now, without any further ado, let's go to my conversation with Emily Contois. Emily, welcome back to the show. I'm so excited to have you back again on Food Psych. Thanks so much for having me, Christy. I'm so excited to be back. Yeah, it's so great to talk with you again. And our first episode together was a fan favorite. I think it's still one that gets referenced so often that people really learn a lot from because we talked about the history of diet culture and, you know, how we got to this place where diet culture is so pervasive in American culture, which was episode 121. That was like, feels like a million years ago. And it was actually only three years ago as we're recording this. But, you know, a lot has happened in three years in the world and I'm sure in your life, too. So can you catch us up on what you've been up to since then? Yes. So being on the podcast was such a wonderful opportunity. And I think I was chatting with you as I was finishing my dissertation. I was thinking about sort of masculinity and dieting. And then also this question of like gender and our entire food media landscape, where those ideas came from about who we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to act, how our bodies and food and eating all go into that. So since then, I did. I graduated with my PhD in American studies from Brown University and then was really lucky on the academic job market, um, but I did land a tenure track job in media studies in a department that's really special and thinks food studies is media studies as we think about food as a medium um, that connects us, that provides a channel for communicating, that is this space for shaping who we are and how we think. And so it's been a thrill to join this department at the University of Tulsa. So we're living in Oklahoma now, which is interesting too. And then I guess those first two years was, you know, getting settled here, meeting my students. I teach courses in popular culture, advertising, persuasion. I have taught our introduction class of how we all think about media theory and our own individual media diets of what we consume every day, how it shapes how we move through the world. And then in all those in-between moments was working on the book, right? Turning the dissertation into the book. 
So this November was really excited to have Diners, Dudes and Diets, how gender and power collide in food media and culture come out. So that was maybe my one bright spot in all of 2020, right? I had the same crummy year as everybody else, um, but was really excited to see this book come out into the world. Yeah, I was so excited to see it too. That was a bright spot for me as well because it has been a year. It's, yeah, like for everyone, it's it's been a rough one. But uh, I love the book. I think it's so fascinating and also so interesting that the department where you landed really thinks of food as a medium and as part of media studies. I think that is super fascinating because I think there's such an intersection from my perspective, just thinking about diet culture as sort of a media study, you know, something that I study a lot from from that perspective. I think the discourse around food in media is so formative for so many people, right? It shapes our relationships with food in so many ways without our awareness or knowledge. And so being able to bring people's awareness to that and to all the ways that our relationship with food or our thinking about food is being shaped must be so rewarding. Absolutely. And I think you and I have both thought about our responsibilities as writers, as journalists, right? Putting information about food and eating, about nutrition science and how we interpret it out into the world for consumption. And so to bring that critical eye to a food media landscape, right? Which is sometimes about recipes, right? Or talking about food cultures all around the world and how we bring those lenses of a feminist approach or critical race theory, of fat studies, right? How do we think through the those kinds of perspectives in that food media space as well. That it has, it's been such a rich space to expand. I mean, American studies, right, was what my PhD was in. So it was always so interdisciplinary. It was always interested in those connections. And so then to really bridge, find these nice roots in media studies, it has been a very generative place to think, to research, and then to learn and teach along with my students. That's so fascinating. I have a background in food media, too. I feel like we have so many of these fun, like, cross-connections of similarities in our career paths. And having worked in food media, I resonated so much with some of what you wrote about in the book around, you know, the dutification of food and food media and its sort of approach to getting more male viewers in in creating this kind of like hyper-masculine food culture was something that I experienced even at Gourmet Magazine where I worked, which was, you know, had sort of a, it was a venerable old magazine. It was around for 75 years before it folded in 2009. And it was like, had this connotation, I think, for some people as like your grandmother's food magazine. And so we were always kind of fighting against that, right? Like, how can we kind of push the envelope and, you know, talk about fire and butchering, you know, like these things that were going to sort of ignite a younger audience and maybe a more male audience as well, you know, bring in sort of a gender balance. Yeah, that's what's been interesting because I know I've been, you know, reading with my students thinking about, you know, the huge gender imbalance throughout our food world when we think about restaurant kitchens, right, and celebrity chefs and how it is so much harder, right, to be a head chef as a woman, to get a loan, to open your restaurant, to convince food media, right, to review your restaurant, to write chef profiles about you. And even when you get that media attention, we often write about women in really different terms, right, that they're nurturing and that there's this sort of domesticity to their creativity while men, right, are geniuses and innovators and empire builders. And so, you know, seeing those dynamics play out even on, you know, this more consumer level, as I think a lot of the time it is, it's, you know, women, food, media, you know, journalists and practitioners writing these kinds of stories, right, and trying to figure out how to make them exciting and enticing and interesting to a male audience. When in, what I'm looking at in the book is this perception that you're pushing back against these conventions of masculinity, right? Of like, are men allowed to be interested in food and have Pinterest boards for recipes and, you know, have all of these sort of foodie perspectives? There's a set of scholars who came up with the term gastrosexual, right? Building on the metrosexual as a sort of male gender identity that could walk that line of straightness and gayness, right? But still be really interested in food. And that's relatively recent. And so I think in addition, right, to folks like you and 
me, right, like trying to write in a way that is responsible, but also pushing, you know, trying to find those audiences. I was so surprised that even in cookbooks written for men, where the forewords were written, you know, by really well-known male chefs. And they would still tell these incredibly lame stories, right? About cavemen cooking over fire and like, you don't have to worry about cooking at home, right? This is what men have done since the beginning of time. Like, I'm so infuriated, right? That even up until a couple of years ago, those are the kinds of stories we're telling to convince men that it's okay right? To be interested in food, to cook, um, you know, to do it in these domestic spaces versus in these professional kitchens, which have been sort of not just imagined, but actually had boundaries, you know, sort of built around them, right? That these are masculine spaces where men are successful and powerful. And so, yeah, it's layered from culinary school to how we write about it, to how critics do their work, to how academics analyze it. But I really want to try and get at all of that in the kinds of texts that I was analyzing in the book. Yeah, I feel like you you did such a great job of exploring and unpacking so many different areas of the food world and how they intersect with gender and race as well and sexuality. Like, it was fascinating. I'm curious to kind of just go back to definitions and and sort of, you know, start with this idea of like dude food and the dudification of food and what you mean by that. Because I think the dude is sort of a specific archetype. Absolutely. So I describe the dude as like the slacker hero. And so in all cultures, right, at a particular time, in a particular place, hegemonic masculinity defines this sort of number one way of being a man. And so when we think about what that looks like in sort of typical American culture, right, this man is strong and aggressive and assertive. He's a breadwinner. He's in control. He's strong in body and in sort of how he controls his emotional register. And so that form of masculinity sort of makes all other ways of being a man orient themselves around that. And so the dude is what scholars have called like a hybrid masculinity. He resists some of that sort of hegemonic expectation, but at the same time, he still remains complicit and benefits from that overall sort of structure of power that that hegemonic masculinity puts in place. And so the dude, right, wasn't going to be about breadwinning. He wasn't going to try and have the muscle building, you know, fitness magazine body, right? He was going to slack off. And so I look at that in a particular historical context around the Great Recession, right? That this standard of masculinity is always out of reach. It's always an ideal. But during the recession, it became wholly, you know, impossible, particularly for millennial men, right? Who couldn't get jobs or who lost jobs, couldn't buy homes, maybe had to move back in with their parents, that all of these ways that our culture defines masculinity weren't possible. And so the dude was this way to like still fully be a man, to feel comfortable with oneself, to refuse to step out right into this experience that was far less bright and successful than you'd kind of been promised. And so I was fascinated by how I could see the food, the media, and the marketing industries all kind of manipulating the dude in order to sell these you know, different foods or food media phenomena that were perceived as feminine. Because the dude is cool and nonchalant and he doesn't really care, he can engage with all of this food stuff from such a distance that it doesn't impinge upon his sense of masculinity at all. So it provided this kind of flexible masculinity for certain men who already had considerable power, right? So we're talking about men who are white and cisgender, who are straight, who are able-bodied, who are relatively young, um, that it gives that flexibility and gave us this different way of being a man that food media sort of ran with for a certain period of time. So those are all the examples that I'm looking at in the book. And so dude food comes in as, you know, this specific genre of food that I ended up defining as comfort food, but with an edge of competitive destruction, right? So it's like yummy food that you'd want to eat, but instead of it just being a cheeseburger, right? It's a cheeseburger with like multiple patties and gigantic onion rings in it and, you know, grilled cheese sandwiches instead of buns, right? Like it ends up being so tall, you couldn't possibly get your mouth around it, you know, so it's exaggerated 
elevated in its flavor, in its nutritional profile, um, in, you know, perhaps, you know, crazy spiciness being added to it, that it's sort of pushing back against these rules of sort of acceptable food, acceptable masculinity, of table manners, of nutritional moderation, um, that it's sort of totally out of bounds. And so I was interested in how these industries sort of took hold of the masculine precedents set by dude food. And then they tried to manipulate them to sell things like Weight Watchers and yogurt and cookbooks and diet sodas. And that is so fascinating to me, the way that the dude archetype has been marketed to in this particular way, right? Like one example you give in the book is like Dr. Pepper, you know, had a low calorie drink and it's like, I won't say the number, but it's like blank, what was it, bold calories or something, bold tasting calories? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it might even say manly bold calories. Like it's so on the nose. They're not even trying to be subtle. I think their tagline was also, it's not for women, right? Like they were very overt oh in what they were attempting to do to assure men, right, that you could drink this lower calorie soda. All of the, you know, when I was looking at Coca-Cola and at Dr. Pepper, it was Dr. Pepper Snapple Group at the time, but now they've merged with someone else. But looking at how they wanted to talk about their focus group findings in the trade literature when they were trying to launch these sodas and explain why they developed them. And so they would say, right, that this younger demographic of men didn't want to drink diet soda because they perceived it as feminine. They didn't like the taste. They didn't like the look and feel of packaging. But they did want a lower calorie soda to meet their health goals. So there was this supposed need for the product, but wanting it packaged in a different way because of how they felt about their masculinity. And so you see both Coca-Cola with Coke Zero and then Dr. Pepper 10 take this, you know, approach of like, how do you go after men getting a, how do you create for them, right? A non-diet diet soda. Like that's the story that I tell. <laughs> I know. And it's so fascinating because in diet culture at large, I feel like there's this impulse to create non-diet diets, right? Things that are masquerading as not diets, even calling themselves anti-diets, which as the author of anti-diet <laughs> feels very ludicrous to me, but trying to sort of shape shift and hide the fact that they're diets. And in this particular case of marketing to dudes or marketing to men in general. There's this way in which they're trying to hide the diety nature of the product because it's seen as feminine. And you talked about the, the idea of gender contamination in the book. Can you describe what that means and sort of how that applies to this food marketing phenomenon? Yeah. So marketers came up with this term to describe when a particular product has come to be understood in gender terms, and then you try to switch it. So it's the resistance that consumers exhibit to that gender bending of a brand. And so if a brand is perceived as masculine and women consume it, there's not much of a problem there, right? Because when we think about how power is organized in society, that's viewed as sort of empowering, going up the ladder. So that seems okay. But when men, right, are, you know, to, to consume a product that's perceived as feminine in a patriarchal society is a social transgression and a risk and a step down. Um, and so in order to sell these products that were perceived as feminine, these marketers all thought that they were having to thwart gender contamination. They were having to push back against it to compensate for it and find new ways to convince men that it was okay to consume and to buy these products. And that's where you get those such overt statements like, it's not for women. Or I remember like one point in the book, you talk about Luna bars having, you know, there's like forums devoted to the bars and men asking on the forums like, will this make me grow breasts? Will this turn me into a woman? Like all of this anxiety around the product actually doing something to their body. So like having to sort of get out in front of that and sell a product explicitly toward men, even if it's a product that has that gender contamination, like yogurt is another example where the, the packaging of the yogurt is so overtly geared towards bringing men in. And even the marketing around, I think one example you gave in the book was like yogurt that was, there was some sort of like draft pick or some sports, I don't know, <laughs> sports related <laughs> metaphor that contest that they were doing around this yogurt to sort of lure men in with this sports related discourse. 
Yes, you're referring to the, the flavor draft pick, right? There the it idea is, yeah. To, to sort of vote and choose, right, of like what the next flavor for the yogurt could be, but within this language, right, of football so that it was properly masculinized. And I do, I open the book with, you know, exactly that line of, you know, will eating Luna bars turn me into a woman or make me grow breasts? Because it seems so ridiculous and impossible and like a joke. But there was this real concern for men that I think is much greater with food than it is for other consumer objects, right? Like to like my husband, for example, like totally buys women's sneakers, right? Because they come in great colors and fun patterns and like our feet are close to the same size. But like some men would never do that, right? To buy something in the women's section. But with food, there's this like extra level, right? That you're bringing the consumer product into your body, right? The food is so intimate because we eat it and we digest it and it literally becomes a part I like to say of ourselves and of our cells right it is you know figuratively emotionally and scientifically physiologically a part of us and so you know I opened with that older example but I could have opened you know with one that happened just last year with the impossible whopper um, that there was this sort of you know <laughs> very discreditable scientist you know I think he was a veterinarian you know saying that the estrogen right the soy the estrogen content and the impossible whopper would make men grow breasts, right? That it was too much and that it would sort of destroy their masculinity. And multiple reputable news sites, right, have to write or choose to write responses, right? The Washington Post, the Atlantic, right? Like really respectable sources of journalism, you know, writing back to tell men, you know, no, <laughs> eating the Impossible Whopper, even though it's not real meat, this really powerful signifier of masculine identity and of masculinity that that isn't going to cause any problems. And so thinking about how those ideas continue to circulate. When I've been sharing the book with my students, one of the questions they asked me, you know, was what did you find frustrating about writing the book? And I think they thought I'd say something about the writing process. But part of it is how frustrating these examples are, right? It would be one thing if I'm saying, ah, this is what happened, you know, in 2008 and maybe up until 2011 because of the Great Recession. But the examples in this book, Christy, go up until 2019, right? Like, we're not out of this yet. And we so should be. Um, So I think that's part of the reason, right? That even though some of these examples of the gender binary being applied to food and our body, feel so antiquated, right? Like 1950s or, you know, historians would point even you know, further back to like the Victorian era, um, that these ideas are so old, they feel so outdated and out of step of who we are. And I think that we're starting to see that change. But at the same time, right, we're not out of the woods with this yet. And that is infuriating um, as someone who spent, right, 10 years or more, like working with this evidence and writing the story. Why do you think that is that this is still so pervasive? Because, you know, when you talked about the origins of it, it seems like kind of the early 2000s and the Great Recession were sort of like where it really took hold and took off. But now, in, you know, 10, 20 years later, what is the what is the continued allure of this type of marketing, this type of approach to food? Yeah, I think the quick easy, sad answer is that we still live in a patriarchal society, right? That still subordinates women and doesn't view them as equal and doesn't pay them equally, right? On and on and on. But also, you know, as I track sort of the micro histories within that 20 year period, there is a shift and a change after 2016, right? When Donald Trump is elected, we kick into a different moment in American history where there is, you know, incredibly overt toxic masculinity, including right in the White House coming from the president of the country. We have much more overt examples of sexism that happen in broad daylight in a different way than they have before this. And then that goes all throughout, right? The increase in hate crimes, the conversations we're having about race, about police brutality and lethality, all of that kicks up in reaction to that big moment, right? Of, oh my goodness, is this who we are as a country? And so I think in that micro history, that post-2016 moment gives us one to look at the dude as a reactionary force, right? He is not as violent um, as incel culture, for example, right? There isn't that kind of violence and hatred to him, but he is responding to the same things. He's just doing it in a way that is kind of playful and ironic, 
and a little bit silly, but it is a different response to the same sort of set of questions. And it's still a part of a sort of anti-feminist backlash. Hmm, that's so fascinating. Because the dude, right? Dude culture, the dude abides. It seems so like, so chill, right? Dudes are just so chill with everything. And there's a world in which maybe they could be just so chill with women having equal power or with trans folks or whatever, right? They could just be chill with everything. But it seems like the chillness of the dude is actually sort of a chillness with the status quo and like benefiting from the status quo, right? Because the dude is, like you said, you know, a sort of stereotypically white, cisgender, able-bodied, privileged guy. Exactly. That that ability to chill, to slack off, to not care is inherently privileged, right? That you have to have a lot to be able to say, nah, no, thank you, right? Um, that so many, right, are hustling and struggling and trying to survive while the dude is just like, ah, this isn't what I expected. I'm just not going to even try. And so we think about with gender too, right? That there are some female dudes, but not a lot, right? That like femininity in a patriarchal, you know, sort of context doesn't give you the freedom to sort of slack off like that. And then I think another, you know, thinking about dude food, right, as this like masculine, you know, genre and exemplar that like the dude figure is actually kind of different from, even though, right, it shares the word um, that like dad bod was something I really wanted to talk with you about, because I think you'll have insights too that I argue, you know, that like dad bod is this embodiment, right? It is the body type of the dude that pushes back against that muscular lean ideal to, you know, not be that that lean, right? It's a body that I think the way it was, you know, disp- I think it actually comes out of like college writing, right? It's like a young woman who comes up with this term, you know, and it's this bod that like works out, but also like totally, you know, drinks a ton on the weekends and eats a full pizza at a time. And so in that way, there is this tension that it's still a body that's like recognized as fit and productive. Um, And when we think about healthism, which I know you and I have thought about a lot, like it still falls under all of those sorts of strictures, right? It still fulfills all those kinds of requirements. Um, It's just saying, you know, no, I'm not going to try and have really low body fat, you know, like someone on the cover of a fitness magazine. But dad bod, right? never turned into, you know, open embrace of mom bod, right? Of like women's bodies that actually gain weight for real reasons when they make babies, um, maybe have trouble losing it afterward for real reasons, and did, did nothing to dismantle diet culture as it created this more flexible, um, sort of lauded and appreciated body type for men. So maybe that shows a little bit more clearly, like how those dynamics of power flow through the dude. I think that's such a such a great illustration and it it reminds me so much of the body positive movement and how at its roots body positivity came out of fat liberation and was sort of this way of translating some of the ideas of fat liberation to like eating disorder recovery and bringing freedom with one's body to a larger audience and has roots back to the 1990s at least. And there's, you know, a lot of really sort of political thinking around it that started, you know, at the inception. And still some of the proponents of the term body positive, you know, one of the original creators of the term body positive or two of the original creators have their organization, The Body Positive, which is doing a lot of really great work around helping people heal body image and stuff like that. But I think the body positivity movement in general, especially as it's been social media-ified, you know, like as it has come to social media and taken off there and hashtags and influencers and stuff like that has become very watered down and has done very little to move the needle beyond just like, oh, now here's a woman with no visible abs sort of bending over and she's got a little roll and she's showing it. And like, maybe that's beneficial for her to sort of like share that and to get feedback that's positive. And it's maybe beneficial for a tiny percentage of the population that like sees themselves in that picture and thinks, okay, maybe I can give up my ridiculous diet plan and and stop, you know, working to get visible abs, which are not something that most people assigned female at birth are able to achieve. But overall, it just sort of reinforces that same hegemonic femininity, right, of having to be thin and able-bodied and white and cisgender and fit within a very narrow box. And it opens, you know, maybe cracks the lid of that box like a 
teeny tiny bit. And so a few people can kind of peek out of it, but everyone else is still like, I'm in this box and it's not admitting me or it's not allowing me to actually see out. Exactly. That as it sort of got reduced and watered down, that it got so heavily commodified as it sort of circulated through culture and it lost its collective politics, right? That it becomes about how only individual people feel about their individual bodies versus a far more progressive, inclusive, collective politics of these are bodies, they are all great. (laughs) And that, yeah, we need to sort of expand the notion or just blow up the box entirely and not have a box into which people are supposed to fit. And yeah, the dad bod really doesn't do that either. It's, you know, the same sort of thin, white, able-bodied, you know, gym-going figure that is just now not restricting their carb intake or, you know, completely over-exercising. But it's still the same person with the same privileges with, the you know, a lot of the same behaviors that's sort of not watching themselves as closely. And I can see that, you know, for some, again, very narrow segment of the population, that sort of visual representation might be helpful in, like, allowing them to let go of some of their more disordered behaviors a little bit. But it does nothing sort of systemically to actually move the needle, as you say. Exactly. And I think maybe the final thing that I find so so interesting about DadBot is that when it sort of first makes media waves in 2015, and then all the way up until last year, right, where there's still sort of survey findings and discussions about DadBot that like will not go away, that so much of it is also about like sexuality and heteronormativity, that so much of the conversation is that like women find the DadBot more attractive than the super muscly body. And so as I was, you know, doing presentations, you know, just doing Google image searches, right, of like, what shows up when we type in male ideal body, right? And we get muscles and they're all white bodies. But you also come up with some of these images that have like bizarre little spectrums of like what a good male body is. And so there's like less attractive, right? For a body that doesn't have very many muscles. But then on the other end, there's like the bodybuilder you know, hypertrophic, like over-exaggerated muscles. And that's what is pointed out as the least attractive, right? Because it is a body that is in too many homosocial spaces, right? Of like, it's a body other men, you know, in that sort of subculture find attractive, but it's not attractive to women. And so thinking about that sort of perspective of also layering over, right? This expectation for straightness that comes out in these ideas about what ideal male bodies are and should be and where dad bod fits into that, but in ways that are far less subversive. And particularly in how media covers them, that so much of it is that like women like dad bods. And so men can relax a little bit because women are still going to find them attractive. Right. And it's, yeah, just the same thing in reverse of telling people like men will find you more attractive if you gain weight or something for a woman. What are we really saying there? Why is that the goal? Why is heteronormativity and heteronormative validation the thing to be striving for in like healing one's body image. I mean, it reminds me too of something else you point out in the book around marketing food-related things to men, sometimes involving this really overt sort of statement or imagery around like, you're going to get women into bed with you if you do this, right? If you cook this recipe or if you buy this product, like you will attract women. You'll have women in flocking to you because you're providing in this way, which is just such a heteronormative way to market stuff. And, And yet, you know, for expanding cooking and food products to a male audience makes a lot of sense for for marketers to take that approach, right? It's like a way, again, of saying sort of overtly, like, don't worry, this is safe. This isn't going to make you gay. You know, this liking food is is compatible with straightness. Yeah, that everything I was looking at in the book was how to like both masculinize and heterosexualize, right? This interest in food. And I love how you're bringing up, right? This idea of like the seduction and sort of control of women being part of this recommendation for men of like why you should learn how to cook, whether it's cooking, you know, a dinner so good that you're going to get her into bed or that you can cook breakfast the next day, right? We hear those sort of two stories told over and over again in these men's cookbooks. And that messaging had been there for like, 
like decades and decades. And so then to be looking at this corpus of cookbooks from 2000 to now, and it's still there, um, is really frustrating, right? Because sometimes the introductions to those texts would also be talking about, you know, relative increasing gender parity and, you know, men cooking more at home and why that's a good thing. And, you know, hailing women professional chefs, you know, they would tell those stories at the same time that they would provide recipes with those sorts of head notes, right, that are still talking about seduction and sexuality. And all of that is happening within a food, you know, domestic landscape, where the food work, even in the most feminist and egalitarian right of marriages and partnerships, where that food work still is not shared equitably, right, but particularly between um, a male and female partner. And so there's been so much good and infuriating, frustrating writing during COVID-19 of how much of that work is still being disproportionately prepared and done by women. And so this call to have men cook more, right? It's not just to like order pizza when it's your night to feed the family. And it's not even, you know, to cook one recipe. Um, but so much more of that food work, right, is about finding the recipes that everyone, particularly in a family, right, with kiddos, with picky eating, right, a, a recipe that everyone will eat or at least try. It's managing everything in the pantry. It's managing a family budget that might be tight. It's figuring out the grocery shopping. Um, it's timing the meal, getting everything cooked, cleaning everything up, right? It is so many things beyond just cooking. <laughs> um, and so we think about all of that food labor and how it's still in most families, right, gendered feminine and being done disproportionately by women, that when we really think about an equitable, inclusive future, um, where women, you know, are allowed all the same opportunities as men, that food work is a really important piece of the puzzle that we have not figured out yet. Yeah, the second shift is not going to go away unless the food work becomes part of something that men and heterosexual partnerships take on. Yeah. And I think first wave feminists, right, they were advocating for kitchenless homes right? They didn't think every home needed a kitchen, right? There should be a community kitchen. And whether it was everyone in a community took a turn or whether that was a service, right, that you sort of outsourced and paid, um, you know, a reasonable fee for, that all of that labor shouldn't be something that individual women were responsible for if they were going to be fully publicly, politically enfranchised as equal citizens, which I find so fascinating. Because I've also done research on like the deep cultural meaning of having a, like a snazzy, kitchen, right? Like if it doesn't have beautiful appliances and granite and a gigantic island, like, do you even really have a kitchen, right? Like so much pride in what our kitchens look like and so much shame, right? When they don't meet those ideals. So it's been fascinating to see the kitchen take on that kind of status within the architecture of our homes, within how realtors talk about kitchens, you know, as they sell homes that has like sort of re-entrenched, right? The importance of all of this work instead of getting rid of kitchens, right? And like thinking about our homes and this labor differently. Oh, that's so fascinating. I'd never, never heard that before that first wave feminists wanted there to be community kitchens and to have cooking be something that was done at that communal level rather than just in the sort of dyadic relationship at home, you know, between two partners. I mean, if that had happened, can you imagine how different the world would be now? Like, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's wild. This also makes me think of like you share just in the intro to the book a little bit that I was like, oh my gosh, I want to hear more about this. And feel free to not talk about it if you don't want to talk about it. But the the whole thing around like Breitbart picking up your story and getting this ridiculous amount of trolling and the sort of gendered way in which that trolling happened. And one of the common refrains being like, get back in the kitchen, right? That, you know, women who are trolled online experience. It's so fascinating that that is still, that line is still out there, right? That was, you know, a first wave feminist thing of like getting out of the kitchen and we're now in 2020. Like, what are we doing here? Having people, you know, teenage boys probably, right? Tell women to get back in the kitchen. Like, it's just infuriating. Yeah, it was so interesting to see those themes, right? Of like, go make me a sandwich or get me a beer or get back into the kitchen, right? This idea that women um, are supposed to be serving men in this sort of subservient way and that the kitchen is this still foundational physical and sort of 
metaphorical space, right, where that subordination takes place. And so, yeah, I'd written, you know, a short paper um, on themes, you know, related to this book and thinking about how things like, you know, the idea of spiciness, right, having this sort of masculine element of the competition, right, to eat spicy food that hurts your body. I remember, you know, going out with a friend who was kind of a bro guy, right, you know, ordering this really, really spicy burger, and then, you know, just sort of cursing at himself, right, for being such a chick for not being able to finish it. And it's like, oh, come on, right? Like, that's not what's going on here. Right? It's spicy. It doesn't have to have something. Um, and so thinking about spiciness, I'm thinking about, you know, eating bar food in public, and this whole risk, right, of eating in public in particular ways, how we still viewed that attached to ideas about femininity and masculinity. I've also been writing about, you know, food on the political campaign trail and looking at how women candidates, right, they pose a totally different risk. They tow a different line to, you know, eat a corn dog at the Iowa State Fair when they're campaigning versus for someone like Pete Buttigieg, right, who I think ate the entire fair and it was like hilarious and no one minded. But, you know, Elizabeth Warren, like she holds on to that corn dog the whole time and never takes a bite. Right. Because I think the headline that Eater came up with, which is so true, is like there's no elegant way to eat a corn dog. And the way the public perceives us as women is so different. I think in 2016, one of my favorite examples um, is Hillary Clinton at Junior's in Brooklyn, which has amazing cheesecake. And so there's all these plates, and these beautiful slices on the table. um, And she's looking at it sort of longingly. And, you know, the reporters are asking her, you know, are you going to have some? And she's like, I learned a long time ago not to eat in front of you guys, because no matter what you do as a female candidate, it's going to get spun in a way that ends up hurting you. And so thinking about these, you know, dynamics of eating in public, right? So I was interested in those layers, right? Of flavors, ways of eating, ways of performing who we are. And so, yeah, that spun off the rails pretty quickly when so many um, right-wing outlets wrote about it. And then all the trolling was, it's funny, it's so not personal, right? The way that they go after, you know, women scholars or particularly right, women of color, like the way they try to go after academics is like a formula, right? Like none of it is personal. But at the same time, when it's happening to you and it infiltrates your social media space, which I've been so lucky that for the most part, it's been this really happy place, right? Where I find new collaborators or I get to you know, interact with folks who read my work who aren't in the academy, like social media has been this really lovely place. I've loved being in public as a scholar. And so to have that ruined, you know, for a short time where it became the most miserable place in life, that was like so infuriating when we think about how these social media platforms have been set up to operate. And it's been in the last couple of years, right, that so many of the men, right, white men who created these apps, and platforms are saying, you know, oh, (laughs) we totally messed up, right? Like, we did not create a techno utopia, right? Where everyone could be who they were, just share their ideas. And it was going to be happy, happy space um, that we've created a horrible place for discourse and for interacting with one another. And so particularly on Twitter, right? When this happens to you, like there's nothing you can do. You're just out there in the public having people say horrible things about you. And so one book I love that another sort of feminist media scholar wrote um, is about the gaming community. And so she was writing trolls and sort of the logics of the game that they're playing right? Like they're trying to get you to respond. They're purposefully tagging, right? The university where you work to try and get them to sanction you, right? For them to say you've done something wrong, for you to get fired, right? And so there are whole organizations, right? Sort of um, invested in going after scholars and particularly in going after women scholars. And then the other funny thing when you look at all of the headlines, right? I love to tell my students, right, that the the meanest thing they could possibly call me, right, is that I'm a feminist professor, right? That that's this horrible, horrible thing, you know, to be. Um, And so I think to be able to talk about this openly with my students, I think one of the happiest teaching evaluations I ever got was from a student um, who came from a really conservative rural background and left the class feeling like she had learned that what she thought a feminist was, was not what she had been taught. That there were so many ways to be a feminist and that it wasn't this man-hating thing. Um, and so 
to sort of come to that understanding and to learn through the experiences that I'd had. Like that was really special, right? To to have her learn that through that experience too. And so I haven't gotten trolled for the book yet, but I'm sort of like waiting for it. I wrote a op-ed um, for NBC, right? It's like big national publication, which is exciting on like how to smash the patriarchy at Thanksgiving. And so it wasn't about, you know, forcing men to do the dishes. It was about looking at how all of the ways that the expectations for masculinity, like actually hurt men too at Thanksgiving, right? This expectation that you carve the turkey, even if you have no idea what you're doing or to eat too much, or if you're a vegan, you're supposed to eat the meat or you're not a man, right? So looking at all of these conventions from this like pretty generous perspective, right? Of not, you know, that the, the, the quest for equality and inclusion and then like the joy, right, that comes after that is all I'm interested in. And so I only had a couple, but I definitely had a guy on Instagram who was really annoyed with me, right, who said I was the dumbest person on the internet, which always cracks me up. <laughs> Dude, I got three master's degrees and a PhD. Like, you can call me dumb if it makes you feel better. But like, I'm okay. Yeah. And then another one who, you know, Facebook Messenger is so weird, right? Because it feels so personal, like a text where this person's allowed to come into your life. And, you know, are you anti-male? Like, I'm the one who makes the turkey. Like, how dare you say these things? Like, I'm like, did you read what they said, sir? Like, good job. I'm proud of you for making the turkey. So there haven't been a lot. But you do, you kind of brace yourself right? Knowing that it could come back around again. And it is, it's really unpleasant to go through, but I will continue speaking truth to power, right? Like if you get that, it just means you've done something right. And so even though it hurts and it's uncomfortable and I wish it didn't happen, um, there's no way it's stopping me from writing the stories. That's great. I'm so happy to hear you say that and grateful that you're taking that approach. I have been thinking a lot about this stuff too, since writing my book or since before my book was out and just sort of thinking through like all the additional scrutiny that was going to come my way and being a more public figure than I had been before and sort of leaving that small like safe social media bubble and in going into a maybe bigger social media bubble that was less safe feeling to me. And all of that thinking sort of dovetailed or culminated, I guess, in watching the, the film The Social Dilemma earlier this year. And something just kind of broke in me <laughs> when I watched that. It was like everything that I had been sort of filing away over the years of like, yeah, this is bad. Oh, this is really bad. Oh, this is the harm of Facebook groups. Oh, this is the harm of like Facebook in general. Oh, this is, this, these are icky experiences I've had on Instagram and Twitter. These are ways in which our privacy is being compromised by the internet. All of it just kind of came rushing to the fore for me. And I finally f hadn't been on Facebook really at all anyway. I mean, I had been on it, but like I hadn't been using it. I finally deleted my account. I dramatically curtailed my use of all the other social media platforms that I'm on. And I have to say, I'm so much happier not engaging with people in the comments, not reading what is being said about what I share. I kind of get, you know, still share once a week, just like the podcast stuff and kind of surgically get in and get out. And it's been, it's done wonders for my mental health. And I don't know long-term what it's going to do for like my career to be sort of close to opting out entirely. I'm reading this book right now called 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now by Jaron Lanier, who's like a old school leader in the virtual reality world. He was like, you know, there in the 90s when the internet was being built. And he's like, I'm a successful public figure who does not have any social media presence at all. He's got a, quite a few years on me. So I feel like he had a lot of time to build towards that. And maybe there's a privilege in that. He's also a white guy. Like, but I'm seriously considering just be opting out of social media altogether and just being like a person who writes books and makes podcasts and writes newsletters and does whatever else, you know, because I, I do like totally resonate with what you're saying about the loveliness of being able to interact with people in that space. And when it's good, it's so good. But when it's bad, it's so bad. And I feel like it's polarized us so much as a culture. And there's really good arguments around how like the political polarization we're that we're feeling right now in this country has been driven largely by social media and not just in the ways that you sort of see on the surface, right? Not just in the like the Cambridge Analytica, you know, Russian bots and things like that, but actually like 
the sort of steady, consistent drip of content, like pulling us away from engaging with other points of view and getting more and more extreme. And of course, as a someone on the left, I'm like totally quick to point that out and on the right and see that so clearly and have seen that so clearly for so long. But it's making me also think about the tendencies in myself to like really silo and sort of shut down against opposing viewpoints. And I don't know, it's been like this whole other parallel journey that I'm on in addition to like the COVID journey of 2020. So we'll see that we'll see where that takes me. But it's just I do appreciate your optimism about social media and it's making me feel like, okay, maybe I can actually stay for a while longer, keep a toe in Instagram world and Twitter world and enjoy the good experiences that I have there. Because the point people have made is that these spaces could be managed significantly better to ensure that this sort of like actual abuse, right, isn't happening. And abuse is just one of the things, right, going wrong with these social media spaces. Yeah, it's like the business model, the business model in general being based on monetizing our attention. Yes, so you'd have to invest in this idea of what should the quality be and the safety be right in these spaces. And so we just haven't seen that investment. So whether that will come from something like government regulation or from one company doing it and then shaming the others into doing it, that like there is a way forward where the good parts of these platforms could be more prominent and could thrive, but it'll require, right, a big change in what they're doing. And then I think the other thing, you know, when I've seen, you know, you tweeting, you know, back against or, you know, the pieces you've been writing too, right, about how risk factors, right? For COVID-19, we're thinking about, you know, body weight as one of these risk factors. That when we talk about people with larger bodies, when we talk about race, when we talk about feminism, patriarchy, and, you know, gender inequality, like that's when we get trolled, right? Like we get trolled when we're talking about something that is important and that some folks don't want to talk about because they don't want to see that shift in power and push those views. And so, Like, even if it's ugly, I feel like it happens when we're talking about the most important things that there are, as we imagine a more just and joyful future. And so I feel like, I know, it hurts, I don't want to do it, but like, that's why I stay. And that's why I keep spreading those messages. Yeah, I think that's so, that's so important. And I feel like these discussions need to be had, you know, I think we all are just having to grapple with our relationship with these technologies in various ways, and it's going to work out differently for for everyone. One thing, you know, sort of going back to the book, because this is reminding me of the section that I really wanted to talk about, about Guy Fieri, and, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, how I feel like you actually made me so much more sympathetic to him in the book, but also some of his popularity and the fan base really comes from this kind of polarization that has happened in this country, right? And this The people on the right who feel left out of the Michelle Obama White House garden and the new American cuisine, Michael Pollanification of food, of the food landscape, you know, and that Guy Fieri is speaking to this like right wing (laughs) in a lot of cases or more or maybe not right wing, but rural oftentimes or Midwestern kind of sensibility that doesn't get a lot of play these days in food media. And it's really interesting, too, to see like the backlash against him from that establishment, that kind of newer food media establishment, you know, the Anthony Bourdain's rest in peace and and David Chang response to him, right? So I'm just kind of curious to like talk a little bit about that, about what he represents, what Guy Fieri represents, and how this sort of dude archetype in food has scrambled the brains of some other male food figures, you know, influential figures in the food world who are in a lot of ways very similar, right? And this, these sort of boisterous, big personalities with bold flavors in their cooking and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so within the book, he is, you know, this dude chef figure. And I argue that he pushes back against some of these norms of masculinity, right? And that he wears shorts and he has this crazy hair and he's always you know, screeching at us at top volume and top enthusiasm. So he pushes back against some of these expectations, right? Of like what a real man should act like. But at the same time, it's also about how a chef 
should act and how a food media figure is supposed to act. So he's pushing out of those boundaries in a way that I actually find really interesting. And then even as he sort of frames himself in his early years as this like rock and roll, you know, crazy off the hook chef, he also every step of the way talks about his son. Right. And how important fatherhood is to him. And so in some ways, he gives us a really interesting figure of a man who does like cook for his family and thinks about feeding and nurturing in kind of a different way than other celebrity chefs sort of show that side of themselves. So in his early years, he was doing these like rock and roll cooking tours, right? The idea that you would go to like a stadium and Guy Fieri would come out and cook for you and like tell jokes for an hour, right? Like I wish he still did them. It must have been so crazy to attend. And so Julia Moskin, who's this amazing food writer for the New York Times, you know, interviewed people who came to the shows and they would say things like how Guy Fieri was the only one who wasn't talking down to you on Food Network. Right. That they didn't feel like he had the elitism and the pretension of like foodies and of, you know, this broader food media scape, like food networks, like pretty middle of the road. Right. Compared to like Gourmet or Sever or like all these other, you know, wonderful food outlets. But for a sector of folks like they felt like that wasn't for them and that for Guy Fieri to be you know, shining the spotlight on everyday mom and pop restaurants and to be showing them in food cities all across the country. So I actually talk a little bit about this with my students here in Oklahoma, right? Because I teach a food media course. And so Bon Appetit, I think it's two years ago now, named Nunsuch, this restaurant in Oklahoma City, as the best new restaurant in the country. But when they sent a journalist to write about it, the headline that they end up choosing goes something like, how does a restaurant in a city nobody ever goes to by chefs no one has ever heard of, and then there's something else, you know, derogatory, become, right, this best restaurant in America. And so there's always this sort of like cultural derision and pretension, right, when folks from, you know, big food cities, right, and I've lived in California, I've lived in Boston, I loved being on both of the coasts, but I grew up in Montana. Hannah. And so I've always had this extreme frustration with how we view the entire rest of the country, right? Like flyover territory is an incredibly rude and unfair way to refer to the rest of the country. And Guy Fieri like does not do that, right? He has been to almost every single state and he shines this enthusiastic, off the wall, crazy light and joy on restaurants in all of those places. And so there is this populism to him that really resonates with his fans. And so there are some fans who I argue view him, you know, kind of like a populist, like Michelin star or Zagat Guide, right? Like they literally put pins in a map to follow his recommendations. They view him as an expert and as someone who they want to follow at the same time that a lot of them confess, right? Like kind of enjoying him, right? And who he is. And so I wanted to turn the most generous read to that, that I could of how he resonates with genuine fans like that. And then also as I dug into these Guy Fieri fandoms, there's also this like much more ambivalent space. Media scholars like to write about what they call anti-fandom, which is kind of like hate watching, right? Like the deep pleasure you can get from hating something in media. And so there's definitely people, right, where there's an anti-fandom around Fieri that's much more ambivalent, right? Like some of it is affectionate and then some of it, you know, is completely agreeing with a lot of the critiques of Fieri, um, that his polarizing potential of why people deeply love him and then some people really hate him was why I found him so fascinating to unpack as a food media figure um, and as someone sort of embodying this dude identity. And so, you know, there's Fieri Con, right? This bar crawler where one dresses up like food guy Fieri. And so it started in New York and it's been in all sorts of cities. I mean, you can, you know, Google how to be Guy Fieri for Halloween, right? And all these costume ideas come up and he leans into it, right? Like I think maybe last Thanksgiving, like he started a Twitter thread. It was just like, respond with your costume, right? Like he totally is open to that ambivalence um, of people dressing up like him in a way that's really genuine or that's openly poking fun, that I feel like he's been able to kind of navigate these tensions in a really interesting way. But back to that point about the dude and it's his privilege, right? That I've 
I found, I titled the last section in that chapter, The Rise, Fall, and Rise of Guy Fieri, because, you know, Pete Wells reviews his restaurant in Times Square and gives it the first and I believe only zero star poor review the New York Times has ever given, right? And it blows all the conventions of food criticism. It's written entirely in questions and it aims to just completely eviscerate, you know, Fieri in this restaurant. And instead, right, of it ruining Fieri, he's like recuperating right by men's magazines and tons of other publications who instead just kind of say like he's this like unrecognized genius he's this good dude that we should just be celebrating like why i mean there's this whole comedian stick right which is just like why would you shit on guy fieri he's just this nice guy and I found that like so interesting and how it took on a whole nother level during the California wildfires of 2017 and 2018, when he was cooking in this charitable way, right, for first responders, for people who'd lost their homes. And then during COVID, right, he's also been partnering with the National Restaurant Association to fundraise for the many people in the hospitality industry who have lost their jobs and are still not back to work, right? We have not had a, you know, government bailout that's needed for restaurants and for the hospitality sector, which, right, (laughs) employs like 10%, right, of the American American people. It's humongous. But at the same time, right, that he's done all of this charitable, honorable stuff and has been understood as this good guy that people can rally behind, he's also always apolitical, right? Unlike Jose Andres, who will directly, right, critique the Trump White House for its policies, who will actually fight back and be much more, you know, politically active in moving forward and bringing about change. Like Guy Fieri has this sort of dudish approach, right? He's never going to go, or at least to this point, right, isn't going to go to that level. So thinking about the limits of the dude and also like how it maintains that privilege, right, to move through these moments unscathed. Um, And so it was, oh, such a fascinating, I could have written a whole book about Guy Fieri. That chapter was so much fun to write. There's so much there to think with when we consider this dude food media figure. Yeah, he's fascinating. And I feel like the privilege that protects him from having to engage and the privilege of being able to just be a dude and skate by and not let things phase you is such an interesting counterpoint to, like you said, you know, the the love for his kids, obviously, the charitable work, the just cheerleading for these mom and pop restaurants that he does. He's a he's such a complex and fascinating character. I'm never again going to just write him off in my mind. I think I, I want to like also do a deep dive. My husband watches him sometimes and I'm like, why are you watching this? What? <laughs> I can't, I can't please change the channel. But now I'm actually going to give it a chance and probably complain and, and critique as we watch. Yeah. You don't need to be a fan, but I think he's fun to think with if you give it a chance. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. You, you sort of, uh, opened that door in my mind with this book. <laughs> so many things in this book, I think, are are fascinating things to just continue chewing on. And it's it's such a good food for thought for anyone who has considered, you know, gender dynamics in food and gender dynamics in diet culture and diet marketing. It's just a great resource. Can you tell us where people can find it and learn more about you if they aren't already following you? Yeah, so I'm at emilycontois.com and at emilycontois on Facebook, which I'm less just like you, but also on Instagram and Twitter. The book is available wherever books are sold. Um, I encourage you to support your local indies, particularly during COVID, but you can get it anywhere where you buy books. Amazing. We'll link to that in the show notes as well so people can find it and buy the book. And thank you again so much for coming back on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. No, this was so much fun. Another highlight of 2020, something good. So thanks so much, Christy. This was lots of fun. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to Emily Contois for being my guest on this episode and to Joy Cox for co-hosting the Ask Food Psych segment. And thanks as always to you for listening. If you want some help healing your relationship with food, you can get support from me for free by going to christyharrison.com slash strategies. There you can sign up for my email list and get my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. Just go to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. 
If you've gotten something out of this podcast, please help us reach more people who need to hear the anti-diet message, because who doesn't, by sharing this episode and subscribing to the pod on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. You can see lots of different places to subscribe at christyharrison.com slash subscribe. That is christyharrison.com slash subscribe. And I'd love it if you also left us a nice rating and review in your podcast provider of choice, which is another way to help new listeners discover us and is always so appreciated. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we discussed, plus a full transcript, just go to christyharrison.com slash 269. That's christyharrison.com slash 269. And to get the transcript, just scroll down to the bottom of the page and enter your email address. This episode was brought to you by my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. If you're ready to make peace with food, break free from diet culture, and reclaim the life it stole from you, learn more and sign up at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. A big thanks, as always, to our editor and sound engineer, Mike Lalonde, our community and content associate, Vinci Chue, our administrative assistant, Julianne Watasek, and our transcriptionist, Mycroft Holmes, for helping me out with all the moving parts that go into producing this show every week. Our album art was photographed by Abby Moore Photography and designed by Melissa Alam. Our theme song was written and performed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs. And I'm your host and producer, Christy Harrison. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, stay psyched.